Now, you've heard it said that the apple does not fall far from the tree. And you know what that means. You know that we say that when we see the same behaviors, we see the same attitudes, maybe we see the same looks or characteristics in a child that 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 child's parent possesses. The, the children reflect the characteristics or the, or the values of their parents. And so we say, well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And we have, we have good examples of that in our own congregation. I mean, who can spend any time at all with Sarah Zanders without seeing in her the spirit of her father? You can't, you can't talk with Ariana Stout for but a couple of minutes before you sense the gentleness of her mother. If you spend any time at all with Daniel Reed, you'll be exposed to the dry humor of his father. Who can interact with Deb Roby and not wonder, where did she come from? (laughs) See, because most often the apple does not fall far from the tree, but sometimes they roll downhill a ways. (laughs) Most of us reflect the looks, the character, the values of our earthly parents. But here's the thing. Every Christian, every single one of us should reflect the values of our heavenly father. And your heavenly father delights in covenant mercy. He delights in covenant mercy. And we're going to see how that works out in the book of Ruth today. And I'd like to invite you to open with me to Ruth chapter 4, And this morning, we'll be reading the first 12 verses of Ruth chapter 4. You'll find it on page 224 in the Black Pew Bible in front of you. Open up the Word of God. Put your eyes onto God's Word. I want you to recall that Ruth had proposed to Boaz. He accepted her proposal, but there was, there was a condition that had to be met. Remember, Boaz was a kinsman redeemer. He was one of those near relatives to the dead husband of Naomi and to the dead husband of Ruth who could step in and fulfill the obligations of a redeemer, helping to raise up an heir for their dead husbands. But he wasn't the nearest relative. There was one in the village who was a nearer relative than Boaz. And so today we're going to look at the contrast between this nearer relative whom whom we'll call Mr. So-and-so. Mr. So-and-so, on the one hand, rejected the covenant mercy of God. And Boaz reflected the covenant mercy of God. And in the case of Boaz, the apple had not fallen far from the tree. And so, as we read together from Ruth chapter 4, the first 12 verses, listen for how Mr. Mr. So-and-so rejects and how Boaz reflects the covenant mercy of our God. And as we read together, remember that this is God's holy word. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So, when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. 
Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Now, I want you to remember that neither Boaz nor Mr. So-and-so stood under the exact letter of the law because the letter of the law said the brother, the brother of a dead man had to marry his dead brother's wife to raise up an inheritance for, for him, but the spirit of the law meant that extended members of the family could, could do that as well. But I want you to remember that Boaz saw the law as a tool for for mercy and sought to emulate not simply the letter of the law, but to embody the spirit of the law as well. And so he pursued hesed, that, that word that reflects the covenant mercy of God. It's a word that describes love and fidelity and undying kindness all wrapped up into one. And so as we look at and compare and contrast the actions and attitudes of Mr. So-and-so and, and Boaz, we're going to see firstly that Mr. Mr. So-and-so rejected covenant mercy. He rejected living out the values of our heavenly father. He He rejected covenant mercy. And the context again is from Deuteronomy 25 and verse 6 where the law stipulates that the brother of a the brother of a, a, a dead brother has to marry the wife and raise up a son. And Deuteronomy 25, 6 says, The first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. And so, if Mr. So-and-so married Ruth, then he would have to raise up a son who would bear the name of Elimelech's family and not his own. And Leviticus 25, verse 25 also adds, if your brother becomes poor and sells a part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. And it wasn't just if your brother uh, became poor and had to sell off the land that he had inherited, but also if he died without leaving an heir, it was your responsibility to redeem that land so that that land would stay in your family and would always be a part of what had been apportioned to you by God when the people entered the promised land. So Boaz, in agreeing to marry Ruth, has agreed to fulfill both of these obligations of the kinsman redeemer. Because of that, he went to the city gates to transact business in the city gates. And so in verses 3 and 4, he calls everyone together, and then he says to the redeemer, Naomi's come back. She is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I would, I'm telling you of it this day and saying to you, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know. And the man answers and says, I'll redeem it. He says, I'll do it. Here's why he'll do it. If, if he buys the land, then he buys the responsibility to care for Naomi until she dies. He buys the land and buys the responsibility to care for Naomi until she dies. But, but remember that Naomi is beyond childbearing years. And so Mr. So-and-so bears no responsibility to raise up an heir through Naomi who will then become the inheritor of the land. So here's what it meant. Naomi's land is going to become his land, which he would then pass on to his sons. And so Mr. So-and-so would incur a short-term expense, which would lead to long-term profit for him and a long-term inheritance for his sons. This is a good deal. It's a good financial transaction. It makes sense. I'll spend a little bit of money short-term. I'll have to provide for Naomi, who's a widow. She doesn't require a lot. But in the long run, this land is going to mean that my own investments will prosper, and then I'll be able to give it to my sons who will follow on after me. And so he says, I'll redeem it. I'll do it. But then in verse 5, Boaz says, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. And then the Redeemer said, Wait, I can't do that. I can't do that. In other words, Ruth, through her dead husband, was a co-owner of the land that Mr. So-and-so proposed to buy from Naomi. Ruth was a co-owner of the land, and Ruth was of childbearing age. And so, if Mr. So-and-so redeemed the land, here's what it meant. He'd not only be required to care for Naomi, 
<clears throat> he'd also be required to marry Ruth and raise up an heir for Ruth's dead husband. And what that meant was that if he married Ruth, the firstborn son to their union would be counted in the lineage, would be counted in the genealogy, would be counted in the inheritance as Ruth and by extension as Naomi's son and would therefore inherit the very land that Mr. So-and-so had just purchased from Naomi. So what do you mean? I got to buy this land and take care of Naomi, and marry Ruth, and raise up a son, and pay for all the expenses of all that, and then at the end, that kid inherits the land, and it doesn't really ever belong to me, even though I bought it, and it doesn't go to my sons. That's what it meant. And so Mr. So-and-so looked at this, and he says, this requires a short, a big short-term expense with no long-term financial gain. And so he says, no, I can't do it. And the gist is that Mr. So-and-so wanted to protect his financial assets and preserve his own name in Israel. He said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. I can't do it lest I impair, incur, incur a cost that is unacceptable to me. And the cost is my own inheritance and my own name in Israel. So here's what motivated Mr. So-and-so, self-interest and not covenant mercy. And from that perspective, the law was not a tool of mercy for Mr. So-and-so. It was a financial burden that he was simply unwilling to bear. The law was a financial burden that he was unwilling to bear, and he used the fact that Boaz existed to bear the burden for him to get out from under it. And so Mr. So-and-so rejected the covenant mercy of God. Now, I know what that's like. I know exactly what it means to reject uh, covenant mercy and to have my own interests at heart. Here's what used to happen uh, back when I was in seminary. This tells you how long ago I was in seminary. We didn't really have email yet. There wasn't email. So, so here's what happened. Um, uh, when, when new students or new families are moving into town, either moving on campus or moving uh, off campus, uh, oftentimes the, the folks from the admissions department will call around to people in the seminary and say, hey, uh, we've got a moving crew planned for Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Can you be there and help people move? And, and I, in my own self-interest, at the time I was single, so this is what I would do. In my own self-interest, I would say, uh, yeah, who's coming into town? Now, if it was the name of a single woman and there was a possible wife in it for me, I was all over being part of the moving crew. But if it was the name of a family, I always had something that I had to do, some other reason. Because really what I was doing was looking out for number one. And that's what you see here with Mr. So-and-so. And you may wonder why I'm calling him Mr. So-and-so. Well, if you look at verse 1 where Boaz says, turn aside, friend, sit down here. The word friend is literally so-and-so or a, or a certain someone. And what that tells you is this. The author of the book of Ruth is purposefully withholding the name of the man who wanted to preserve his name. He's purposefully withholding it. He is nameless. Now, I want to ask you this. Uh, he was seeking to preserve his name and his inheritance. What are you seeking to preserve? Most of us don't have, have a living via agriculture. Most of us are not trying to preserve that type of land-based inheritance, but but what are you seeking to preserve to uphold? Uh, what do you want to reflect? Are you interested in, in preserving and promoting your name or preserving and promoting the Lord's name? And sometimes those things will become in op opposition to each other because in order to stand for Jesus, you have to take some of that costly discipleship upon yourself. But, but whose reputation would you rather see suffer? Would you be willing for your reputation to be low in order for his to be high? I mean, this, this works out in all kinds of ways. And, and for you young people, I'll just say this. If you actually say in the world today that you believe that the Bible is an historical document and you believe it accurately explains to you things like creation, you can expect that people will consider you to be a fool. But what matters more? What people think of you or what people think of Christ Jesus? Each of us has to ask these types of questions because we can't have two masters. Um, is, uh, for, for me, sometimes, the thing that I value more is, is, is my time. It's my time. 
mine, 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 mine. It's not my time. It's his time, uh, and I'm supposed to use it for his glory. Some of you value money, and it's, and it's your money, and you cling to it tightly, but it's really his money, and you're supposed to use it for his glory. What about your gifts or abilities or education or training? These all become a part of living for the Lord and displaying his covenant mercy. Are you only responsible to the letter of the law or also to its spirit? And again, we come back to this question, if hesed, if this idea of living for covenant mercy or for somebody else weren't costly, well, then of course everyone would be doing it. But everyone's not doing it. Remember that Jesus said to the the man who wanted to go bury his father, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. The way of faith is self-abasing and it's Christ-exalting. The way of faith is always self-abasing and and Christ-exalting. And the pattern that the Scripture gives us over and over again is God first, neighbor second, me last. God first, neighbor second, me in a distant third. And what you see in Mr. So-and-so and what you see in me and what you know in your own heart sometimes is that we take that neighbor third and we go, or me third, and it comes over here. Now, me first. Me first. Maybe God second, you a distant third. And you know what this, this is like because there's a difference between service and sacrificial service. Service when you don't have anything better to do. Service when it doesn't require anything of you. Service when you like the person you're serving. Service when you're doing a, an act of service that you actually enjoy. Um, and then there's sacrificial service when you're called upon to do something at 2 o'clock in the morning and you'd rather sleep. Or when you're called upon to serve somebody that you really don't like. Or... Now, too often, I reserve something for me. Mr. So-and-so reserved his inheritance and his name. And what he was doing in that, without, without probably consciously thinking so, he was saying, I am more important than Ruth and Naomi. I matter more than Ruth and Naomi. My inheritance matters more than their sustenance. My wealth matters more than their well-being. And what does Paul say about that in Philippians 2 and verse 3? In humility, count others more significant than your, yourselves. And so Mr. So-and-so preserved his inheritance in his name for the rich young ruler. He was uh, seeking to preserve his, his money. What will you not sacrifice for the sake of covenant mercy? Will you not sacrifice your, your reputation? Will you not sacrifice your alone time? And, and I can't answer that question for you, but what I can do is, is to encourage you to take stock of your heart and your priorities and ask the Holy Spirit to search you and to reveal to you the things that you would not willingly give up for the sake of reflecting your Father's covenant mercy. Are you living by the spirit of the law or by the letter of the law? Are you pursuing covenant mercy in your relationships? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God, putting God first and neighbor second? Are you taking responsibility to extend covenant mercy or simply looking out for number one? You see, Mr. So-and-so rejected the covenant mercy that we so often see in our Heavenly Father. And it's such a stark contrast because Boaz reflected God's covenant mercy. He reflected God's covenant mercy. Look at verse 7. It's a strange custom that's being described. They take off the the sandal. It may come from Joshua 1 where God promised Joshua with every place his sandal sets. That's going to be be their land. But wherever it comes from, the idea is that the sandal signifies the land and this visibly represented the transaction that was taking place. And so in verses 9 and 10, Boaz explicitly states something very important. He says... Uh, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and to Malon. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. So this is what Boaz says. Let me summarize for you. He says, uh, I will spend my money on land that will not remain mine, I will raise up a son who will bear another man's name. That's what he says. Now, uh, I want to say this. This is a terrible business deal 
from a, from a financial perspective, this is a terrible business deal, but it's a beautiful example of covenant mercy because he puts God first, he puts other people second, and he puts himself third. Boaz sought first the kingdom of God, and so the people give a benediction. They gather around and say, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. And remember, uh, Rachel and Leah were the, were the mothers, so to speak, of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then also, may you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez. And Perez was, was the house, the head of a strong line. Perez was the son of Judah. You remember the, the Jacob, as he was blessing his sons, told them that the kings would come, come from Judah. And that Perez was a particularly strong house from which Boaz himself descended. And so Boaz re- reflects the covenant mercy of God. The people even recognize what he's doing as, as a good thing. Boaz reflected the covenant mercy. And mercy is always risky. And, and there's a type of mercy that we like and a type of mercy that we don't like. Here's the type of mercy we like. We like the Jean Valjean type mercy. For those of you who have ever read or, or listened to or seen uh, Les Miserables, then you know that Jean Valjean is a criminal. And when he is shown mercy by the bishop of the town, the mercy melts his heart. And he's a changed man because mercy comes to him, and he responds to that mercy with repentance and faith. And then there's another kind of mercy where you extend mercy to somebody, and they think that they've pulled one over on you. They scorn you and hate you for having given them mercy because they've gotten one up on you, and they think that they've bested you. And it doesn't melt their heart. It hardens it. And that's the risk of being merciful. Uh, Mercy is holy for another. Mercy expects and usually receives no return on investment. Mercy is self-giving and self-sacrificial. And so you see this in Boaz who who bought back from ruin, bought back from real, honest-to-goodness, physical, temporal ruin from a place of destitution. He bought back Ruth and Naomi at great cost to himself. And in that sense, he reflected the covenant mercy of your God. And that word is chosen very carefully. He reflects it because somebody bought you back at great cost to himself. You see, Jesus embodies the covenant mercy of God. And so I want to ask you, are you reflecting what he's done for you? It was Jesus who said that there are uh, two great commandments, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself, and that's the order of priorities, God and neighbor and then me. And if loving God is costly to self, then it is as it should be. And if loving neighbor is costly to self, that is as it should be. Are these the priorities that mark your life? See, Boaz discovered in the law the same principles about the character of God that Jesus explicitly embodies, principles of love and humility and mercy and service and fidelity, because the law is is nothing if it is not a reflection of the character of your God. It's a reflection of his character. It, It helps you see who he is. And so there's a promise in Jeremiah 31 that when when Jesus comes, he's going to do a work of heart transformation in people to produce obedience to the law. And Jeremiah 31, 33 says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. The Lord actually scribes the law on the hearts of his people so that it weaves into our hearts and becomes a part of the fiber of who we are. It becomes a part of the, the, the place from which we begin to think and make decisions and move and act. How then should a Christian live? A Christian should live according to the law. Not to earn salvation, but to reflect the covenant mercy of him who already saved you. Because the very mark of a Christian is that the law of God has become the heart principle that informs our lives. And we see it as a tool to enable us to engage in the covenant mercy of our God with those around us. Is that true of you? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. 
He is like a tree planted by streams of water. This is, this is the true of the man. This is true of the woman who soaks in the law of God. So let me ask, what prevents you from living like this? We can look to Mr. So-and-so to get an example. He was afraid of losing what he cannot keep. He was afraid of losing what he cannot keep. Could Mr. So-and-so ultimately keep his life? No. Could he keep his grain? No. Could he keep his silos? No. Could he keep his money? No. Could he keep his land? No. Could he keep his inheritance? No. Could he keep his sons? No. All the things he was afraid of losing, he cannot keep them. He could not keep them. What are you afraid of losing that you can't keep anyway? He was consumed with glorifying his own name to the point that he was willing for Naomi and Ruth to remain destitute in order to preserve his own wealth. Do you see that? They had to remain destitute in order for him to hold on to his wealth. And that was an exchange he was comfortable making. He valued property more than people. He valued his wealth more than these two women. But in Christ, you must know that you will inherit all that belongs to your Father. You are co-heirs with Christ. Right now, you already have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, and the day will come when Christ will return, and the dead will be raised, and the, on the new heavens, the renewed heavens, and the renewed earth, you will inherit all that belongs to your Father because you are co-heirs with Christ. And what does your Father own? Everything. So you have every spiritual blessing in Christ now, every physical blessing is coming to you in the resurrection. And so let's ask it this way. What can you lose in this life that will not be yours a hundredfold or more in the life to come? Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples in Luke 18. Again, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Paul said it differently in Romans 8, 32, asking this question. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If the creature, Boaz, could reflect such covenant mercy, then how much more merciful is your creator? Are you determined to share and to reflect and to live Christ's covenant mercy, which he has lavished on you and to lavish it on other people? Or will you, like Mr. So-and-so, reject it? I want you to note something. I want to speak to those of you, some of you... um, some of you are very different than me. You, have, you just have business sense. You have entrepreneurial sense. You have financial sense. You're good with money. You know how to make money. You live in the, a corporate world. You live in a world of, of finance and business. And, and it's an incredible blessing when you apply those gifts and those talents to the body of Christ. But, but there's also a danger to allow the world's understanding of what makes financial sense to direct you in areas where the Lord's understanding of covenant mercy should direct you. Because I want you to see that from a purely business perspective, we should applaud Mr. So-and-so for his shrewd financial sense. We should applaud him. He recognized a bad deal. He smelled it a mile off, and he stayed away from it. And he did a good job evaluating his resources, making sure that his IRA was stocked, that he would take care of himself, that he would take care of his children. He made sure that his business wasn't adversely affected by being too generous to destitute people, and he made a shrewd financial decision. That's what Mr. So-and-so did. He did not let his personal feelings or his family connection with distant relatives influence adversely his business sense, and he made a sound call from a financial perspective. And from a financial perspective, Boaz is a bozo. Think of what he's done. He's purposefully told his reapers to do a poor job harvesting his field so that Ruth can eat at night. He's purposefully made sure she takes home more grain to her mother-in-law than she could ever harvest in a hard day's work to begin with. And then after he accepts her proposal of marriage, he lays 80 pounds of grain on her back to make sure that her mother-in-law knows I'm going to take care of Now, he could have sold that. 
He could have made some good coin off of that. He could have put it in his, his silo. And then here, he decides, I'm going to spend money I'm never going to get back to raise up an heir for another man who will inherit land that I'm about to buy for the sake of covenant mercy. And it teaches me that we, all of us, whether we're involved in the business or financial worlds or not, all of us need to soak in the law of God and in the covenant mercy of God in order to imbibe a biblical ethic. Because we can look at what Mr. So-and-so did and say, oh yeah, America. Isn't that how we're taught to think? Isn't that how we're taught to invest? Isn't that how we're taught to run a business? But if we soak in the law of God and imbibe a biblical ethic, this is what's going to happen. Often your decisions will confound the business sense and worldly values that surround you. Because the merciful thing to do will often stand in direct opposition to the financially wise thing to do. But since the Lord delights in covenant mercy, you reflect it. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And that means this, that if you by faith belong to the Lord, you too will increasingly reflect your Father's character, His values, and His attitudes And your Father loves covenant mercy. You have received that mercy in Christ Jesus. Now reflect that mercy in your priorities and in your life as you show the covenant mercy of God to those with whom you interact. Please pray with me. Our gracious God and Father, we confess that this is not what comes naturally to us. Father, I confess that too often what comes naturally to me is to look out for number one. Father, will you by your Holy Spirit work your attitudes, your priorities, and your covenant mercy into our hearts such that even in a pale way but in an increasingly brilliant way, we would reflect the covenant mercy of our Lord and Savior. Father, we have received mercy in Christ. Will you please help us to live it as well? Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.